Deva Kunjabi Hadi Gopi Jana Balabha Giri Varadhadi Gopi Jana Balabha Giri Varadhadi Yasoda Nandana Braja Janaranjana Yasoda Nandana Braja Janaranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chadi Jamuna Tiravana Chadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Kunjabi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Gopi Jana Balabha Giri Vrdhadi Giri Vrdhadi Gopi Jana Balabha Giri Vrdhadi Giri Vrdhadi Jāsādhanandana Brajajanaranjana Jāsādhanandana Brajajanaranjana Jāmuna Tīravana Chādhīm Jāmuna Tīravana Chādhī Jāya Rādhā Mādhava Kunjabi Hādhī Jāya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Jaya Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Parivida Vicharaja Sri Sri Madhya's Divine Grace Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Gaur Primanandi Going to hear uh, a whole chap, two chapters from Canto Ten, Srimad Bhagavatam, chapters eighty and eighty-one of Canto Ten, Krishna's pastimes, and specifically the pastime with Sudama. Sudama was a classmate of Krishna in childhood. And Sudama lived near where Krishna lived in his adult life. Krishna lived in Dwaraka, and Sudama lived in Por Bandar. And it's a very nice place, Por Bandar. And uh, we'll see a few images from that place where he was from. And uh, the the lead-in, a little background to the two, Sudama and Krishna coming together, was around 
Krishna's age of 12. So we all know this one. Krishna was born in Mathura as the son of Vasudev and Devaki. And after they offered their prayers to him, he was showing his forearmed form of Vishnu. Devaki had requested Krishna to assume a childlike form. And Krishna said, I'll assume a childlike form, but take me to the other side of the river Jamuna, because there comes, I won't know where I've gone and I'll be safe. Anyway, so it was a Leela, and he assumed a childlike form, and Krishna went to Vrindavan, first Gokul and other places in Vrindavan, until he was a little over 12 years of age. When he was of 12 years of age, um, a messenger was sent from Mathura on behalf of Kamsa to come and invite Krishna, personally invite Krishna, to come take part in a festival, a bow festival. And Krishna went, and Krishna broke the bow. Krishna engaged in combat when he was just 12 years old with a humongous wild elephant. And he finished Kuvalyapita. And he and Balaram, with the two tusks of that humongous elephant, went into the wrestling arena. And there was a battle with the wrestlers and Kamsa, and Kamsa was destroyed. And then the scene where Vasudeva and Devaki were freed from the prison of Kamsa, because he had put them in prison. And after being united, again with his mother and father, Vasudeva and Devaki pictured here, there was a series of events. One of those events was the father of Kamsa was restored as the king. Ugrasena became the king of Mathura. And then there was another requirement, and that was Krishna was from a Chatriya family, Vasudeva and Devaki from a Chatriya family, and he hadn't gone to school yet. And they wanted him to go to school. So they wanted him to have his Upanayana ceremony of receiving Gayatri Mantra and the sacred thread and go to school. So Garga Samhita describes that Krishna decided where to go to school because he didn't want to go to a school nearby because the, re the reasoning that he gave to his father was, I just killed Kamsa and Kamsi had buddies and people may want to cause me some difficulty and so he wanted to go incognito to a distant school and they checked online and did some Google research and found out that, no, they found out that Sandipani Muni was the best teacher. And so they went, Krishna in, informed his father that's the school he wanted to go to, he and Balaram. And so they went barefoot not in royal ceremony as would one might do for a young Chatriya boy, but he went in a, in a quiet way and he joined the school of Sandipani Muni in Avantipur. No, Avantipur was the previous name and Avantipur is near today's Ujjain in India. And that's, in fact, why the Ujjain temple was established is because it's near the place where Sandipani Muni held this school. And one of the other students was a Brahmana. These two young boys were Chatriyas, and there was a rule that although you're Chatriyas, you're going to have to do all these simple things that all the Brahmacharis do if you want to be part of my school. And one of them, as you see, they shaved their heads. They wore a very simple attire. And they were to do little menial services for the spiritual master. That's part of the training. 
not because the spiritual master needs people to do things for him, but it was part of the training of humility and simplicity and so forth, servitudeship to the teacher. And so they were very happy to have that um, relationship with Sandipani Muni, and he was thoroughly versed in all the Vedas. And one of the classmates pictured here, of course here Krishna is shown not with a shaved head, but he had a shaved head. And the Brahmana who has that Brahman thread over his left shoulder, that's Sandipani Muni. At least that's what the artist was intending. It's a little bit young because they were actually 12 years old. And on one occasion, well, it was a regular thing that they would go to the forest to gather ingredients for the sacrificial ceremonies, the rituals. And firewood was one of the things required. And so one fine day they went together to gather firewood. And as the afternoon went on, torrential rain came down. And it was raining and raining and raining. And it's described that there was so much rain you couldn't even tell where the land was. Even the base of the trees had so much water. So they went beneath a very large tree and the night fell and they decided they would just stay together for the night safely under that tree. And they enjoyed one another's company like anything. And um, in the morning, Sandipani Muni had seen that the, these two students of his didn't come back. And so he sent a whole search party. He went with them and found them. And we'll hear later on what the exchange was between Sandipani Muni and, and Krishna and Sudama, his friend. So Krishna learned everything that Sandipani Muni had to teach in a short while. And there's a detail when he was ready to graduate it was just a short while, but he learned everything. So um, Krishna came forward and said, we're ready to go back to be with Vasudeva and Devaki, our parents, but we'd like to offer some dakshin, some gift to you. And uh, Sandipani Muni said, well, I know that you two are very exceptionally gifted. Can you bring back my dead son? Uh, he went to Prabhas, which is not far from Avantipur. It's um, a place where the, the Yadu dynasty eventually left by the, by the sea. So they went, and in short, they brought back Sandipani Muni's son. And they said, Any, anything else you would like? Um, they said, just having you two as disciples, as students, my heart is fully satisfied. I don't need anything else. So they went back to Mathura. And after some time, Krishna and Balaram left Mathura and went to Dwaraka. There's some details of how that happened. And in the course of Krishna residing in Dwaraka, he was exhibiting the opulences of Bhagavan. Because Dwarka manifests the fullness of Krishna's opulences in this world, spiritual opulences being fully manifested in this world in Dwarka. <clears throat> On the other hand, Sandipani Muni, excuse me, Sudama, being a Brahmana, he also became married, and he married a very qualified Brahmani, and they made their residence in Porbandar, as we saw before. Um, the, the chapter 80 of this 10th um, canto begins describing the lifestyle of these two. And uh, Sandi, Sudama was inclined, although he was a householder, he was inclined to pretty extreme simple living. Like, not only he didn't have an occupation, they didn't have children, 
He didn't have an occupation, but he didn't make any endeavor to earn anything to support himself and his wife. And they just accepted whatever came of its own. He was living like a Paramahansa sannyasi. And his wife was very fine with that because she was also like-minded like him. It was a good thing because otherwise it could have been a terrible marriage. But she was very happy. And um, it's said that they had such little to eat. She even eat, ate less than he did because she felt very badly that he had nothing to eat. He was so skinny that it was just like skin and bones. We'll see shortly. His, he was so skinny that his veins were bulging against the bones and the skin. So she, and he only had one cloth. And so she did what loving wives will do sometimes. She was nagging. Now she didn't think she was nagging, of course. She thought she was expressing her loving sentiments for her husband, and she was. And uh, if there's time at the end, I'll read. She was, she, was, she was a qualified Brahmini. She knew the art of using words. So she used words in such a way she knew what the hesitation of her husband would be to say, no, I don't want to do what you want me to do. So she knew in advance what his nose would be, and she gave the answers in, in her request. We'll read it. it. It's towards the end. We'll come back, circle back around. Um, her, her, the essential request is, I feel terrible that there's insufficient... She wasn't complaining about herself having not... You, you're starving. You're, you're so skinny, and, and you know... I can't stand it. I can't stand to see you starving like this. And I know that not only you're a, a brahmana and Krishna is very charitable to brahmanas, namo mahavadanaya krishna prema padayate krishnaya krishna chaitanya namane gauratrishe namaha namo bravani devaya go brahmana hitaya cha jagat hitaya Krishnaya, Govindaya, Namo Namaha. Krishna has great affection for brahmanas. But not only that, you're his friend. You have a friendship, loving relationship towards Krishna. Krishna has a friendship, loving relationship towards you. You won't even have to say anything. Just go there and he'll look at you and he'll understand, wow, my friend needs help. And he'll help you. And for him, it's not a problem. He's maintaining the whole Yadu dynasty. The whole Yadu dynasty is a big dynasty, a humongous dynasty. And he's maintaining them all with one little Brahmin. It's no difficulty for him. So I know you don't want to go. Please go. <laughs> and Krishna will help. Because I can't bear seeing you in this condition. So, what do nag nagged husbands do when they're nagged? They don't say no. They don't say yes. But she kept persisting, you know, in, in loving manner. And he, he finally relented. And he thought, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go asking Krishna for something. I'm not materialistic. I don't, I don't, I'm not feeling uncomfortable. But my wife is feeling uncomfortable about my situation. And anyway, he's my friend and I get a chance to see Krishna again. It's been so long. So his mind changed. So now our acharyas described like this. Sudama's clothing was torn and dirty and he was so thin that his veins were visible all over his body. 
So then the acharyas, and even a common sense person may ask, why, why was he so destitute? How is it possible someone who is a devotee of Krishna, a friend of Krishna, can be in this condition? Does somebody know that Bhagavad Gita verse 9.22? So raise your hand if you know the verse. What's the verse? Loud. And the translation? Unto those who? So, that was Sudama. He was an unalloyed devotee, unalloyed, no alloy, no impurity, no motivation. He didn't want something from Krishna. To such persons who are in, in, un, in, engaged in undivided devotional service, Krishna preserves what he says, I preserve what they have, and I carry what they lack. So it certainly looked like he was lacking. Insufficient clothing, insufficient food, although he was happy, but so why was he in this destitute condition? And here's what our acharyas say. It's a very simple point. A distinction must be made between two kinds of renounced devotees. One is inimical to sense gratification. The other is indifferent to it. The Supreme Lord does not force sense gratification upon the devotees who is extremely averse to worldly enjoyments. This is seen among such great renouncers as Jada Bharata. On the other hand, the Lord may give limitless wealth and power to a devotee who is neither repelled nor attracted by material things, such as Prahlad Maharaj. Up to this point in his life, Sudama Brahman was totally averse to sense gratification. No, Krishna didn't force it. He just accepted, okay, that's, what you, that's the lifestyle you want. Okay. But now out of compassion for his faithful wife and because he hankered to have Krishna's audience, he went to beg from the Lord. So then he turned to his wife and said, I shall go. And, but I can't go visiting a friend without a gift. That's culture. You visit a friend, you bring something. And they didn't have anything in the house to give as a gift. So she went to a neighbor and got four handfuls of broken flat rice. Now, most of you are from India, so you know what that is. Um, those of us from America, we are not so familiar with it. We'll show you a picture in a moment. So here's, in Por Bandar, there's um, some statue made of Sudama who should be a little skinnier than that. <laughs> and his wife, Su, Su Sheila is his wife's name, and she's handing him this little, and in a, one piece of cloth, a little bag. And there's what it's called, that's what it looked like, a close-up of flat rice that looks like good quality. His was broken flat rice. So off he goes to visit Krishna and Dwarka. When he's going to visit Krishna and Dwarka, he's a little intimidated because it's so opulent. And he's expecting, because there's several gates he has to pay, pass, there's guards at the gates, but they see he's a Brahmin and they just let him go. And as he's approaching, there's a description in the Bhagavatam of these 16,000 humongous palaces and they're all huge and very, very, very opulent. The description is there. And one of them, he started approaching. So it's described that Rukmini was her palace or Krishna in her palace. She saw him coming from a distance. 
and she called Krishna's attention. So Krishna and Rukmini saw Sudama before Sudama saw them. And seeing Sudama coming from a distance, now remember, they hadn't seen each other since they were children, but he recognized him. Of course, he's omniscient as well. And so he immediately went forward to meet Sudama. He went to greet Sudama, Krishna. Here's a, an artist's rendering of, he's entering into the palace and Krishna's coming. This one, he's respectfully skinny. And over his shoulder, his left shoulder, that's that little bag that, very important part of the Leela, this inferior quality rice brought into the super opulent Dwarka. And Krishna is very eager to receive him. Krishna embraces him very strongly. And he then takes Sudama to the place where he was sitting. He places Sudama on the place where he was sitting. And he immediately begins worshiping him. So he's showing these different affections. First is friendship. That's a rasa. The servant sees the, the master like friend and Krishna sees his devotee like friend and that's a, a rasa exchange. And then Krishna takes this position of being the worshiper of a brahmana. He is a chatriya, so he, it's, it's a role change. And he worships and Rukmini is also engaged in worshiping. Uh, all kinds of paraphernalia, washing his feet, RT paraphernalia, says all kinds of lamps, different edibles, um, fragrances, and so forth and so on. Very elaborate arrangement of worshiping Sudama. And there's several nice pictures. Assistance to Rukmini, assisting them, and uh, different artists make Sudama look a little different. He looks a little funny. Got a mustache over here. But there's this little bag of, of rice. So then, after worshiping him, feeding him, giving, letting him take bath because he's been traveling so he can refresh himself, they sit down together and start speaking about the good old days. Now it's back to friendship. <coughs> Taking each other's hand, Krishna and Sudama talked pleasantly about how they once lived together in the school of their guru. So going back to the old times, then Krishna starts to ask him, after you left the school, did you become married? No, he's omniscient, so he knows the answer. And, but he's asking in social, in social courtesy. Then he appreciates immediately that his attire makes him look like he's a householder, but on the other hand, he's not an attached householder. So he says, even though you're mostly involved in household affairs, your mind is not affected by material desires, nor, O oh learned one, do you take much pleasure in the pursuit of material wealth. This I am well aware of. And then Krishna says something interesting. He says, different than you, I am taking the position of showing people how to be surrounded by wealth and be detached from that wealth. So I'm doing this to show an example, and you have the same detachment from the same knowledge that we received from Sadipani Muni. That is, jnana vairagya. So one can be a vairagi, a detached person, like Sudama, or one can be a superlatively detached person like Krishna being surrounded by the opulence of the spiritual world. And 16,000 
wives in 16,000 palaces and not be attached. My dear Brahmana, do you remember how we lived together in our spiritual master's school? So, so far, Sandeep, the Sudama hasn't said anything. He's just smiling, appreciating the loving exchange with Krishna. When a twice-born student has learned from his guru all that is to be learned, he can enjoy spiritual life which is beyond all ignorance. So then Krishna starts to speak, and I'm going to read just the verses, of the significance of a spiritual master-disciple relationship that they both shared, because that's something they have in common in their exchange with one another. So here's what Krishna says. My dear friend, he who gives a person his physical birth is his first spiritual master. And he who initiates him as a twice-born brahmana and engages him in religious duties is indeed more directly his spiritual master. But the person who bestows transcendental knowledge upon the members of all the spiritual orders of society is one's ultimate spiritual master. Indeed, he is as good as my own self. So we've just heard, this is Vedic. There's, there's different ways of looking at the principle of the guru, but there's the father is looked to as guru. Prabhupada would explain when Prahlad saw his father Ranyakashipu being torn asunder by Lord Nishingadev, how could he just stand by? Because his father is like Guru. This is Vedic culture. So how can he just stand by and not protest? So um, that's one standard of Guru. Qualified father, of course, not just one who can produce children. And then one who gives the procedure for spiritual activity, including instructions and mantra and thread ceremony and teachings in the Vedas. Then there's one who instructs all. So now the next verse. Certainly, O Brahmana... Whoops of all the followers of Varnashram system, those who take advantage of the words I speak in my form as the spiritual master and thus easily cross over the ocean of material existence best understand their own true welfare. Oh, that's this one. I'm sorry. I the soul of all beings. Now he's describing the second category of guru and then saying the third category is superlative. I'm, I am not as satisfied by ritual worship, brahminical initiation, penances or self-discipline as I am by the faithful service rendered to one's spiritual master. Jiva Goswami's commentary on this statement by Krishna is he's making this compare contrast there's the one that teaches the rituals and gives the mantra and the, the engaged ones in religious activity that's a spiritual master but superior to that is the second type or the third of that in that list one who gives spiritual training and instructions to all and, and helps one cross the ocean of birth and death So then Krishna goes on reminding Sandipani, reminding uh, Sudama of their life in the ashram and the service that they did, gathering the wood in the big storm and being stuck 
and then in the morning the spiritual master coming with the search party to find them and their spiritual master is so happy to see them safe because by that time the storm had ended the water had receded and they were they were cold but they were safe and so sandy panimuni said this is indeed the duty of all true disciples, namely to repay the debt of their spiritual master by offering him with pure hearts, their wealth, and even their lives. You boys are first-class brahmanas, and I am satisfied with you. May all your desires be fulfilled. And may the Vedic mantras you have learned never lose their meaning for you in this world or in the next. So he reminds um, Sudama of these teachings heard from his spiritual master, but now notice he is now taking yet a third position, not just friend, or a Kshatriya honoring a Brahmana, he's speaking in terms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has the different roles and voices and ways of speaking with Sudama, because Sudama is a pure devotee. He's not just like you know, a nice man. He's, he's in this intimate relationship of friendship, like Arjuna is in the relationship of friendship, of course, different according to his personality, an eternal associate of the Supreme Lord. Because we'll hear that in his prayers when we come later. Um, so that ends chapter 80. And uh, Krishna hasn't asked Sudama the reason for his visit. And so Dhamma doesn't volunteer the reason for his visit because he feels embarrassed. He doesn't want to ask Krishna for anything. He's not a materialist. He's moved by the concern of his wife. But she even said, if you just go and Krishna sees your condition, he'll, he'll do something. So the next morning, he, the, the chapter begins saying he felt like he was in the spiritual world. And he was in the spiritual world. The commentary says, wherever the goddess of fortune and Krishna are, the spiritual world is there. He was in the spiritual world. He felt it. Now he's going to go back home. Once you're in the spiritual world, do you want to go back home? He's married, so he's going to go back home. So, uh, Krishna sees tied in his cloth, sometimes it says it was behind his back because he was embarrassed. But he sees this bulge in his cloth and says, what you got there? You brought something for me and you're not sharing it with me. And uh, so Dhamma can't even look at him. He's so embarrassed. The, the, the verse says, the Brahmana felt too embarrassed to offer his palm folds of flat rice to the husband of the goddess of fortune he simply kept his head bowed in shame so Krishna grabbed it and Krishna opened it and Krishna started eating he took a morsel and was praising how wonderful it was and he started to reach for a second morsel and then this is like a, a controversial point. Rukmini stopped him. Not that she stopped him, that was not controversial, but what was her intention? So there's different explanations of her intention. And the one that I like is, how are you going to repay? How are you going to repay? Because what has been offered with such love and devotion by your dear devotee Sudama, how are you going to take more? How are you going to repay him? And anyway, there's, there's other explanations. 
It's this not fit for you. You have a delicate stomach. <laughs> How are you going to digest this? This is not difficult to adjust flat rice. But so there's some different commentaries on the meaning behind her checking Krishna's hand. And it's now time for... So in the Bhagavatam, in this chapter 81, the very same Sanskrit as the very same verse found in Bhagavad Gita is there. Which one do you think it is? Patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhaktya prayachati. If you offer Krishna with love and devotion, even the simplest things, even the simplest things. And there's elaborate commentary by our acharyas on this point. Even the most opulent thing, if it's not offered with love and devotion, Krishna is not interested. And even the simplest thing, if it's offered with love and devotion, Krishna is very happy to accept. And he's fully satisfied, not by the thing, but by the love and devotion with which the thing is offered. So if you have love and devotion, you want to offer something nice. But supposing you don't have the means. This is, some, this is like the very same instruction that Narada gave to Dhruva. When you go to the forest, you're going to make offerings. You can't have the opulent offering that you have here in the palace. You're going to have to offer what you have in the forest. But according to time and place and circumstance, you make offerings with what you have. But what you offer should be with love and devotion. And so Krishna is fully satisfied. Sudama, so he got over his embarrassment and Krishna already took it anyway, it's too late. So now he's going back to uh, poor Bandar, thinking that it's right in the, the, the Sanskrit of the verses, essentially saying, Krishna knows the nature of a living entity like me, who, when he has something, he'll become attached to that something and become proud of having that something and thinking, oh, I'm very special in Krishna's mind because he gave me this something special. Knowing that I have pride in my heart like this, Krishna didn't even ask me why I came. Because if he had asked me, I'm a Brahmin, I'm going to have to tell him why I came. And then Krishna would give me so many things and I'd become proud. Krishna was protecting me from becoming proud. Krishna is so kind. And just meditating like that. Krishna is so kind. It's a wonderful drama. Krishna is so kind. And when he got to his home, funny thing, he couldn't find his home. <laughs> the little cottage that you saw before wasn't there anymore. It was just this fabulous palace and there's verses and verses and verses describing the opulence that was like what he saw in Dorica instead of his little cottage. He was astonished. What happened to my home? It was here just a few days ago. And from out of the palace came assistants, nicely attired, with wearing ornaments and this and that. And this lady came out who we didn't even recognize and she called his name and said, I recognize my voice, but who are you? I'm your wife. He didn't recognize her. She was so nicely decorated. And what happened? And she said, well, I thought you had asked Krishna. And this is what Krishna did. So, oh. So Krishna wanted him. Krishna understood exactly. There's, there's texts where, he's, where Krishna is thinking in the 81st chapter. Krishna is considering, what is the situation with Sudama? I'm not going to ask him, but I know why he came. And I know it's because of his wife, not because he wants material things. So let me satisfy his dear wife, who is so much concerned about his, her dear husband, who is my dear devotee. So he gave him this opulence. 
even though he didn't want the opulence, he was that kind of renunciate. He was averse to material opulence, but he gave it anyway for the sake of his good wife. And it's not like she wanted material opulence. It wasn't that kind of a wife. She just didn't want to see her husband in this condition. There was, she was that kind of wife. So Krishna took care. And there was opulence like the spiritual world, beyond the opulence of heaven. And understanding that's what Krishna wanted, he accepted. And then he, there's the, the chapter ends with some prayers. Just before this, he says, he's the, he's the supreme personality God who presides over all things that are opulent in creation. Life after life, may I serve him with love, friendship, and sympathy. And may I cultivate such firm attachment for him by the precious association of his devotees. Now, one of the sessions we're going to be conducting on Christmas morning is specifically this. The prayers by devotees for association of devotees. And why? Because, so here's the what and why. Because it will continue, it'll preserve attachment, firm attachment to the personality of Godhead. The medium of association of devotees nourishes that. We're going to hear some more, so rather than elaborate. But it's, it's, a, it's a very, sadhu sangha, association of persons who are attached to sat, attached to that which is eternal, attached to the source of everything, attached to Krishna. Association with those who are attached to Krishna is so important for us to become fixed and stay firm in their fixed in our attachment to the personality of Godhead. Now, I know some devotees that circumstances in their life has restricted them from devotee association. And it's really painful to think of the circumstance that they're passing through. Very difficult. Now, it's, po it's commonly as possible through some kind of technology to have some kind of even remote association. But sometimes circumstances don't permit even that without the detail. And it's very painful. It's the, it's the most painful thing. No association. Or it's the most fortunate thing to have association, to have quality association, persons who are attached to Krishna, so we can stay firm in our attachment to Krishna. So here's something that's stated in Canto 3 that's spoken of in relation to the Sadama story. But if one makes friendship with Krishna, one will never be cheated and he will get all help needed. Here's a, a painting of that painting that says the same thing. Again, if one makes friendship with Krishna, one will never be cheated and he will get all help needed. It's a very beautiful painting. Look closely and you can see there's a tear going down Sudama's cheek. And there's a tear going down Krishna's cheek. I mean, he's washing his feet, but they're just staring in each other's eyes, feeling profound affection for one another of their loving service together. Because Krishna wants to serve his devotee and the devotee wants to serve Krishna. And in this case, it's a very intimate relationship of friendship. Very, very special. So, Dhamma. So, I thought this, besides it's a nice story, it fits in with the theme of our uh, time together during this. What we call it? Winter retreat. Let's see if there's some discussion and any thoughts you want to share on this.
Do we have another microphone? Thank you, Marge. Um, I guess it's kind of a comment, maybe a question also, but um, I was just reading the section a little bit, and they and the devotees, in one of the later verses, they say how uh, Sudama, seeing how Krishna was serving him, that touched his heart, and that helped relinquish like whatever remaining material attachment that might have been there in his heart. And um, so it seems like, and, and, and then also the, one of the later verses say that when Sudama came back and saw all of the, you know, his palace that he had now, that uh, he did enjoy it. It said that he, he had some material, he enjoyed it, but then he, rel he relinquished it later on. So, um, I guess uh, I just want to understand it's kind of bewildering that Krishna would give him all of this when he was satisfied uh, and it seems like it sounds like he did have a tinge of attachment but then he relinquished it so there's there's different commentaries um, one of the commentaries just so, so, so there's a balance in all of this one of the commentaries says he continued to live the same lifestyle just sleeping on the floor. And then in the Bhagavatam, it does say it's something very similar to Priyavrata. Priyavrata was the eldest son of Swayambhuvamanu. And when the line was broken, he went to Priyavrata and said, can you rule the world? And he didn't want to say, no, Dad, I don't want to rule the world. I'm, I'm very happy being in the forest. So then Narada Muni came and he thought, great, Narada Muni is going to support my renunciation. And Narada Muni didn't say that either. And so then Lord Brahma came. So like three Mahajans ganging up on him. And Brahma gave him a promise that you when you accept this function of being the emperor, some attachment will come, but you won't, it won't remain. You'll relinquish it. And so he, because it, it's something like, um, it'd be really crummy if um, somebody doesn't have affection for their wife. So, how can you be married if you don't have affection for your wife? So how can you have affection for your wife and not be attached to the temporary? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. How can you not be attached? How can you be? So back to this description earlier, there's those who are two types of renunciates. He was a householder renunciate. He just didn't want sense gratification. He was married, but he wasn't married for the purpose of sense gratification and wanting material opulence and other forms of sense gratification. It just wasn't in him. And his wife was of similar disposition, so it wasn't a conflict in their relationship. I want and he doesn't want, or the other way around. but is the, the affection of his wife. So it was arranged by Krishna the, to re, be responsive to your question. He didn't want, but his wife was feeling badly. So it was to, to assuage or take, take care of the feelings of his wife. He was protected, like Prahlad was protected. He was neither attached nor repulsed. So he could handle having all that opulence. There's a prayer by Prahlad and Canto 7, chapter 10, where he says like that, one who is attached only to you can receive the opulence of the kingdom of God and not be disturbed. So that's what happened with Prahlad. In this case, as with Priyavrata, he was averse. So being averse, 
not like the, the artificial kind of renunciation of verse. He's just like, I'm just satisfied in my relationship with Krishna and I, don't, I really don't want the encumbrance of stuff. And so Krishna didn't force it. Having it around, this rendering that you saw, he, you know, he, he involved himself. Now then comes the question, was he attached? Well, he was attached to his wife. I mean, he, he left Dorica to go back to be with his wife. He was attached to his wife. He was a householder. He was, he was dutiful. But not in the worldly kind of attachment. In another kind of attachment. And so, same with being attached to his wife being attached to that facility and Krishna withdrew the facility and you know, Krishna protected him in short from getting lost in worldly enjoyment you know those who are th thoughtful when they're making the step to become married they have to be thoughtful about what they're doing because otherwise it's, you know, it's a mistake. It, 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 it's taken as, now I have a license for sense enjoyment. And the wife is thinking, my husband is the facility for me to get my sense enjoyment. And the husband is thinking, my wife is the facility for me to get my sense enjoyment. And that's, that's a material conception of what the spiritual function of marriage is. So there has to be some... so. It's one of those, as you know, the hand motion. It's, it's, it's appropriate amount of attachment, but not an inappropriate amount of attachment. And then comes, you know, children. Of course, they didn't have children, but in Krishna conscious household life, they're children. And how, how are you going to be a mother and father if you don't have attachment? You'd be a terrible mother and father if you don't have attachment. But not inordinate attachment because there's an inordinate attachment and your intelligence is gone and you can't you can't see what you can't see straight you can't do what's needed with intelligence so that is that attachment needs to be directed to the satisfaction of krishna that's how it's done and that's what was sudama's position at least that's my understanding he wasn't attached like we might become attached to some opulence that comes our way. You have something? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this lecture. This is the first time I heard um, Sudama lecture for, uh, at this length. And um, so it was very informative. I do know the story in synopsis, but not at this length. Um, and um, I mean, knowing Krishna as God is great, but knowing his relationship with his friends and relatives and the um, father and mother, this is even more like, it's, it's much more nectarian is what I feel. So uh, that's great. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, so um, in everywhere we are uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam and everywhere, there is an emphasis on um, controlling your mind and senses, um, which is basically the first stage of uh, any advancement. Now, in this age and um, day, and now what are the practical steps you can take to control mind? Because I myself feel that, at least in my scenario, it, it goes everywhere. You can't control the, uh, you can't focus on a specific thing more than probably like half an hour or even sometimes five minutes. So just want to understand, <laughs> what are the things that you can do practically uh, in, in our scenario in general um, to do this? It's a nice verse. It's a good one to learn. <clears throat> it's possible to control the senses and the mind if you can control one sense. This guy. The, the tongue. The tongue has two functions, tasting and vibrating. 
So direct the tasting and vibrating tendency or propensity of the tongue towards Krishna. Take only Krishna Prashad. Chant regularly and try as far as possible to speak that which is of Krishna or pleasing, at least pleasing to Krishna when you're even conducting ordinary affairs. You're in your workplace, you don't give a bug if you get a class in your workplace, you'll get fired. <laughs> but you speak pleasingly and thinking, I'm, I want to speak in a way that's going to be pleasing to Krishna. Chapter 17, text 15, Bhagavad Gita. Look it up later. It's, so it's, it, that's pleasing to Krishna. When you, when you conduct your life, starting with the tongue, then you can control the other senses, including the mind. And to capture the mind, this is Bhakti Siddhanta's teaching, it's through sound. To capture the mind, the ear can conquer the mind. That's the teaching. Through so, but it's the right sound. Not the, you know, do ba 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 do ba ba ba. Not that sound. <laughs> okay. So, Paul, you usually have something very wonderful to add to our discussions. Anything this afternoon, evening? I have to think a little bit. But, okay. Um, I, I, I sensed there was something stirring over there. That's why I called your name. Yeah. You want to put it on hold? We'll come back? Yes, like I think. Okay. A little bit. Up here. Guru Maharaj, I have two questions, uh, one for the evening class and one for morning. Uh, <clears throat> the, the statement over there, if one makes friendship with Krishna, what does it mean? What does it mean? How do you make friendship with anybody? What does it mean? And when you understand that, it means you do it with Krishna. Friendship. Service with love in a mood of friend. You know, Bhoktaram Yagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam. He is the dear most friend of everyone. He is your real well wisher. That's what a friend is. Your real, real well wisher. They don't, they don't want something from you. They want what's best for you. That's the friend. So Krishna is such a person. Second question. Thank you, Guru Marsh. Marsh, in the morning you mentioned um, regarding this uh, term depression, and then you were saying um, it is to be understood if there is a night, then it. You know, it is to be understood that the mind does what? It is to be understood if there is a night, that means there is a day also coming. That I couldn't follow. If there's, a, if there's a night, then there's also a day coming. Okay, yeah. That is, everything is temporary. That is okay. Um, so, w when a person is in that negative space, uh, how, do, how does that person divert his... his, his is energy or attention towards Krishna, knowing that the negative emotions cannot be engaged. Knowing that what? The negative emotions cannot be engaged. Negative emotions can be engaged. For example? Um, let's take the Dhruva story. <clears throat> He has a negative emotion. His mother has a negative emotion too, because it was, it was really a negative thing that was done and they have corresponding emotions. So a destructive way is want to get back. 
And the constructive way is engage it uh, in a way that will help you connect to Krishna. So he, he was engaging it in that way. She didn't say, give up this idea of getting a kingdom. She just said, don't do this with the motive of retaliation. Don't ill wish towards her or your, fa or your father. So, but that, that emotion is there. So that's, that's one example. I mean, Naratam Das Thakur gives this very, um, not so detailed, but very specific instruction that there is a place for everything. You know, he uses the example of anger. So he points to Hanuman as using his anger that Sita is being treated so badly. He was angry. And so he used his anger to inform the persons who were tormenting Sita that you're in big trouble for mm. this act. Mm. So it was engaging in that way. Now, we're not elevated like Hanuman, so we have to be very careful. But there's a principle. Thank now you very much. question over here. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, just on the slide, after Sudama's return to home, uh, you were showing Sudama was feeling this, I want to serve uh, Krishna. Um, sorry, I, yeah, um, that love, friendship, and sympathy, I'm, I'm trying to understand that, Maharaj. It's similar to his question of friendship. S shared feelings is sympathy. My friend feels, I feel, out of sympathy. It's not like, pity, it's shared feeling. That kind. The other kind. Yes, I knew it. Okay. Subal. Thank you, Sri Ramaswamy. Um, the so you bring this so many times, you know, in terms of that beautiful picture of Sudama and Krishna seeing in each other mm. and the tear mm. you pointed out many times. It's very touching um, that reciprocation of love and how it's a mutual thing that in one sense uh, is like the, um, the full manifestation of that uh, loving relationship, you know, in that moment. Um, previously to that, when Sudama is in his hut and his wife is saying, why don't you go and see your friend Krishna? And say, no, you know, it seems that he's is not doubting his love towards Krishna, but is sort of not necessarily thinking that Krishna wants or needs or 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 um, deserve, he's deserved to be with Krishna like that. Is his feelings of humility, but in one sense, you know, is is not thinking that uh, that relationship is there from Krishna's side in one sense, because he's. You know, I don't need to, you know, it's, it, it's, it seems like he's doubting in one sense. What's uh, he doubting? He's doubting that Krishna has the time to see someone so simple. So insignificant. Like that, like him. That's so, um, But the fact is that in one sense, the reassurance and the experience of that mutual loving relationship is is it, it 
basically manifests in full his devotion like that. So the, 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 the relationship of love should supersede all those other emotions is what you're saying. Yes, and I'm thinking from the perspective of, you know, devotees and relationships that we have with devotees, relationship that we have with uh, different devotees, you know, um, including disciple and, and spiritual master and um, well, he, senior he allow devotees. Allow Sudama to be an individual just like you and I and everybody else is. He, for example, he has this kind of renunciation that has his own brand. Mm. He's, a household, he's a householder, he's a brahmana, he's learned, and he's so detached that he does, he, he's hardly eating anything and there's nothing to even eat if they wanted to. And he's happy. And he likes it like that. It's not a false, it's just him. Mm. And so similarly, he has a certain regard in his relationship with Krishna that's abundantly humble. You know, more than another person who has hum humility, he has abundance of humility in that particular way. It's him. This is fine. So for someone else, their connection with Krishna, is, their friendship with Krishna is so strong, they get over that humility. In his case, his mood of humility is so abundantly strong, it, it's just part of his affection and his relationship with Krishna, it's just him. It's fine. Each of us are different. That was, that was him. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I was just appreciating that picture in itself, just as you yeah, bring it out. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's very touching. Let me, you just reminded me though, I was going to read at the end, so I'll make the end, and then our announcer can do her announcements. Um, this is um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's explanation of what his wife says. So here's what his wife says. Um, so Sheila is her name. O Brahmana, she doesn't call him by name, she is addressing him this way. Isn't it true that the husband of the goddess of fortune is the personal friend of yourself? That greatest so on the basis of friendship. That greatest of Yadavas, the Supreme Lord Krishna, is compassionate to Brahmanas and very willing to grant them his shelter. O oh, fortunate one, please approach him, the real shelter of all saints. He will certainly give abundant wealth to such suffering householder as you. Lord Krishna is now the ruler of the Bhojas, Rishnis, and Andakas, and is staying at Dwarka since he gives even his own self to anyone who simply remembers his lotus feet, what doubt is there that he, the spiritual master of the universe, will bestow upon his sincere worshiper prosperity and material enjoyment, which are not even very desirable. So two of our acharyas comment she is anticipating his objections, and she knows her man. <laughs> and so she's countering his objections. Sadama might say, quote, how could the husband of the goddess of fortune befriend a fallen soul like myself? And his wife says, Krishna is brahmanya, very favorably disposed to the brahmanas. Sudama might say, but I don't have the qualifications of a brahmana. And his wife replies, Krishna gives shelter to anyone who surrenders to him. Sudama, 
He may give shelter to the saintly, but I am not saintly. And his wife says, but you have great fortune. Otherwise, how could you make friendship with him? So Dhamma, since I have no devotion, I do not even have the quality of surrender. And his wife replies, Krishna is the omniscient Bhagavan. Therefore, he will take note of your unhappiness and be merciful to you. You may not consider yourself a sadhu, but you are definitely in a wretched condition, seeing that you are struggling to support your family and worthy of charity. Krishna is surely giving generously, will surely give generously. Sudama, Krishna is equally disposed to all the countless unhappy conditioned souls suffering the fruits of their own karma. So why should he give wealth to me? Answer, his wife, Krishna is the master of the devotees. He may not give, but the devotees who serve him by fanning and other actions will mercifully give some charity Krishna maintains the yadus. What burden or fault is it for him to maintain you? Sudama, since it is not proper, I'm afraid and ashamed. His wife, he is the shelter of saintly persons like you. He is the only shelter. It is not proper not to surrender to him because you are fearful. Sudama, but Krishna may be in Indraprastra, Dwaraka, or some other place, killing the demons. His wife, Krishna has put aside all his weapons and does not leave his capital of Dwaraka, since Krishna is the ruler of the Bojas, Rishnis, and Andakas. If these opulent rulers merely acknowledge you as a personal friend of Krishna's, they will give you everything you need. Sudama, but I'm embarrassed to ask anything from Krishna. And his wife gets the final word. Krishna gives himself unto any person who just remembers him, even without asking for anything. What to speak of Krishna giving material wealth and sense gratification to his devotee, which are not very much desirable anyway. In the long run, because they're in the long run, they're tasteless. Moreover, Krishna is the benefactor of the universe. And thus he gives to those who entreat him even what they have not specifically begged for. Therefore, if you go to Dwaraka, just remain silent. Krishna will give you abundant wealth. Since he is your true benefactor, he will also give you the sweetness of his lotus feet. And then the next verse says, she kept making this request again and again. And so he relented. He was averse and embarrassed, but he went anyway because he saw his wife was in such distress and being affectionate to his loving wife, he didn't want to see her in distress. She was distressed because of his distress. He was distressed because of her distress. And he went actually just to see Krishna. Okay. So that's a nice two chapters of Canto 10, Srimad Bhagavatam. And we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah.